The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 14th chapter. On Sabbath, when Jesus went to dine at the house of a ruler who belonged to the Pharisees, they were watching him. Now he told a parable to those who were invited. When he remarked, how, when he marked how they chose to chose the places of honor, saying to them, When you are invited by anyone to a marriage feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest a more eminent man than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give place to this man, and then you will begin with shame to take the lower place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, go up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and everyone who humbles, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. He said also to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your kinsmen or rich neighbors, lest they invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. You will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day and the gift of gathering around your word and receiving your, your sacraments. We thank you for the foretaste of this feast, which not only nourishes our faith, but forgives us of our sins through the gift of your Son, who is the eternal word. Lord, we know that faith comes by hearing. Let us hear his word. Let us not only hear it, but doer, be doers also. Fill us with your spirit now that we would hear your words and be moved to action. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Please be seated. You know, I keep telling folks, and they don't want to listen to me, but I, I keep saying over and over again that um, all good things come from Ireland, right? I mean, all really good things come from Ireland. And that includes the language of Gaelic. My grandfather was, uh, uh, was a man uh, who was born in Ireland uh, and lived there just long enough to, to pick up the language. And his, my, uh, my great-grandfather ensured that when he came to this country, he learned, he knew to speak Gaelic, his mother tongue, as my great-grandfather supposedly would suggest to him. But of course, Gaelic is not just a good language, it's full of wisdom. And we got plenty of good wisdom in our text for today, right? But you know, as I, as I, as I read this text for today, there was, a, there was an old Gaelic saying that came to my mind repeatedly. And that old Gaelic saying is this, a person is known by the company he keeps. Now, of course, uh, we understand that to be a, a real uh, you know, maxim in our culture and society today. A person's rank and place is, is identified by the group which one is perhaps seen dining with. I mean, you know, we see that a lot in our culture today, uh, mostly in places like TMZ. Hmm? I mean, y'all know what TMZ is, right? And you know, I see a couple smiles. So if those of you, it's kind of like entertainment tonight on steroids. Uh, and, and, of course, these are the guys walking around with the video cameras following the A-list celebrities, the guys on the red carpets, wearing wonderfully uh, extravagant clothes and expensive cars. And, of course, who are they eating with? Who are they dining with? What trendy restaurants? What fashionable bags are they wearing? Those kinds of questions. And, of course, if you happen to know someone famous, it's not unusual to do a little name dropping, and that happens in any uh, of uh, all of our society today. I mean, we think about things like, uh, uh, like think back to the 80s and 90s. I mean, we, we know that there is a certain associative property, you know, that, uh, that if we're, uh, you know, clearly we're a more important person if we are connected with a person of higher status than we are. 
So therefore, sometimes it's easy to drop a name. Well, who do you know? I know this person. Oh, wow. And that impresses us because we know in our culture and society today, who you know is sometimes more important, and oftentimes it is more important than what you know. And the old saying from the 80s and 90s, I want to be like Mike, as if a pair of tennis shoes could make you slam dunk and win six MVPs. It can't. But there's some kind of associative property to it. So we go out and we buy Michael Jordan tennis shoes, Air Jordans. Uh, and, And we see that a lot, especially in younger culture. And the kids want to emulate. I mean, I ask the kids all the time, what do you you want to be when you grow up? They all want to be celebrities. They want to be a fireman? No. They want to be a fireman. They want to be a policeman? No. That's not cool anymore. They want to be a celebrity. I mean, the idea is they think that being a celebrity is work. I suppose for some it is. You know, all that shopping has got to be terribly tiring. But the whole idea of being an A-list celebrity you know, we want to be clay. You know, we, that's why we get autographs. We're impressed by them for some reason. We want to be close to them. And it, it happens, and it's not just with the celebrity culture. Uh, you know, everybody wanting to be, you know, whatever celebrity, the Kardashians. I mean, I'm still trying to figure out those guys. I mean, what, what do they offer to society other than, you know, the idea that they're famous? You know, they got on television. Okay, their dad was famous. There we go. More of this concept of of, of status by association. And that's kind of how how things work. And it, again, it's not just with celebrity culture. It's you know, it's it happens that way in the corporate world. You know, if you happen to know someone up the executive ladder, then there's a great likelihood that potentially your career could take off because they have kind of been your patron in a in a sense. And if, you, if they see somebody, you're eating lunch with this person, wow, you know that, you know that EVP? I, I, I didn't know what EVP was the other day until my wife told me EVP stands for Executive Vice President. I was impressed. And it also happens in politics as well. I mean, I, I love the, the, the walls that you see in all of, of politicians' offices. I mean, this idea of status by association is clearly a, a, a part and parcel of, of political culture as well. I, I remember when I, was in, uh, when I was a freshman in college at Florida State in Tallahassee, I got an internship working uh, for my, my second semester of my freshman year in a, in a Congress or a legislator's office. And lady ends up being a, a Speaker of the House much later on uh, in her career. Uh, but you could go into her office, and one wall was absolutely filled from about chest level to the ceiling with photographs of her and a variety of different politicians. She happened to be Republican, so, uh, you know, she had a picture of her shaking hands with George Bush and his signature on the picture. And she had a picture of her shaking hands with Ronald Reagan and a picture, a signature of Ronald Reagan on the picture. I mean, it was literally filled with the, the, the who's who of Republican politics, both nationally and within uh, the United States, within the whole country, uh, or within Florida as well. So the idea that if you're part of uh, of you know that your 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 power is oftentimes associated. Your status is oftentimes associated with someone else. So we know that's true in our culture and society. But if we if we gain some level of status in our society by being around the wealthy, the well known, the the elite, the powerful, what does that say about somebody like Mother Teresa? who spent her whole life, chose her life, directed by the Spirit, to live with and associate with the most powerless, the most oppressed, the hungriest, the sickest, the poorest of the poor. Why would she do that? What choice had she made that was so radically different than the rest of society? Modern society, of course, is very status conscious. From the clothes we wear to the homes that we buy, all influenced by this concept of status through association. This is not a new phenomenon by any stretch of the imagination. We can see that uh, very clearly in uh, in our gospel text for today. Patronage dinners were not unusual. 
In fact, they were extremely common in Mediterranean culture of Jesus' day. It was something very common to the Romans, to the Greeks, even in first century Israel, as we see. A formal dinner was something uh, that the elite would use to proclaim their elite status. And the guest list, of course, was always most important. By being invited to such table fellowship, clearly one was elite just by being at table with another more powerful, more elite than they. So, when these powerful individuals would throw dinners, of course, they would not only invite family members, but also important members of community that were needed. They needed to be honored in this way. That is how you established your own influence in society. Again, it's not much different than ours. The old I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine concept is still pretty much part of society as much as it was in Jesus' day. And of course, there was the expectation of reciprocation. If you do this for me, or if I do this for you, you will do this for me. But there was also what Jesus said, which was different than the mode of operation of culture then as well as it is today. I like to read biblical theologians as I prepare for sermons and their various reflections. As I was reflecting on this text, one of my favorite theologians I like to read said this. He said, if Jesus eats a meal with a Pharisee on the Sabbath, well, you could pretty much bet there's going to be conflict. Conflict arises, it seems like, in the Gospels any time Jesus chooses to speak. And unlike E.F. Hutton, when Jesus speaks, people really should listen. So Jesus says this in our text for today. He says, when you give a dinner or banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your kinsmen or your rich neighbors, lest they invite you too, and you would be repaid. But when you give a feast, you who follow me, you disciples of mine, when you give a feast, Don't invite the wealthy, the powerful, the well-heeled. No, invite the poor, the lame, the maimed, the blind. And through that you will be blessed. Because they cannot repay you. I mean, it harkens back to things that we've been hearing now for a long time in Luke's gospel as we've moved toward from the Mount of Transfiguration as Jesus has set His face toward Jerusalem. Many times the idea, don't lay up treasures for yourself in this place. Lay up treasures for yourself in the kingdom of God. So therefore, you want to make sure you honor those whom God asks you to honor. You bless those whom God asks you to bless. Clearly, throughout both the Old Testament and the New Testament, God reflects in His Word a concern for the poor, the oppressed, for those in need. Now, of course, Jesus' instructions in our text today conflict with the social functions of the dinners as they were known, as they were held in that culture and in that time frame. It was one thing, of course, to give alms to the poor, but quite another to eat with them. I mean, the Scripture clearly says you need to give alms to the poor, but eating with them? Really? In doing this, culture would suggest, the host is dishonoring himself, humbling himself, by identifying with the poor, the lame, and the oppressed. But yet there's, 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 that, there's that verse that Jesus says in our text for today, He says, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. Those who invite the elite are exalting themselves. They're laying up treasures on earth. And those who invite the poor and needy 
humble themselves, yet lay up treasures for themselves in heaven. Now, of course, we ought to take note of the fact that who it is that Jesus was eating with in the first place. The Pharisees. Now, I know this seems kind of odd in our current culture, but religious leaders back then were among the elite. Uh, you know, if they'd had paparazzi back then, I'm sure probably some of the Pharisees might have been followed around by the guys with the cameras. Now, I'm not complaining. I'm glad it's not like that today. I'm not, you know, the idea of someone running around after me with a camera, not so much. Yeah. And yeah, not many people want to be celebrities. I mean, there's, some want to be celebrities because they really haven't reflected on it. And with those that have been, they, they get tired of it real quick. But yeah, the, the, the Pharisees were the, were the elite of culture and society of their day. And the interesting part is, as religious as they were, as, you know, as, as clearly focused on the Word of God and the Torah, the instruction that, that the Word had given them, they would not associate with, nor would they dine with, the poor, the lame, the oppressed. And mostly it's because it reflected an understanding, a prevalent theology that was certainly part of their culture, their understanding of what it meant to be a follower of God at that time versus what it means to be a follower of God at this time. And I, I wonder if perhaps some of the same theology that the Pharisees were walking around in their own heads isn't part and part of our own back-of-the-mind theology about how people become poor, lame, depressed in the first place. The prevalent theology of the day was that regarded those who suffered much, such as poverty or infirmity. And they did so because, well, clearly it was their own sin that placed them in their place. I mean, we can see that clearly. In, in several places throughout the Gospels, this prevalent idea that, well, people just got what they deserved. Do we think that in our culture today? Do people get what they deserve? The wealthy are wealthy and the comfortable are comfortable because God is pleased with them. I think it still exists in our culture today, at least in many corners of the Christian world. But Jesus himself roundly rebuked that idea. There's a, there's a, a part of John's gospel where the disciples are at the, they see a man blind since birth and they ask Jesus the question, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Hmm. Or what about in our previous text just from a couple of weeks ago? The disciples reminded Jesus that there were some who had been present that, had been, that told Jesus of, the, of a group of Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with sacrifices. Oh, clearly that was a great religious sin. And Jesus answered, Do you think those Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered thus? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or what about the 18 who were killed when the tower of Siloam fell? Do you think they were greater sinners than any in Jerusalem? Hint, hint, Pharisees, Sadducees, and all the religious elite. No, I tell you, Jesus said, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. The problem that the Pharisees had with Jesus wasn't that he wasn't a good man, that he didn't keep the law, because Jesus did. He came to fulfill the law. But Jesus was the very picture of God's grace and mercy. An unearned favor. For you see, the Pharisees understood themselves to be the religious elite. They understood themselves to be non-sinners. The word Pharisee in Hebrew means to be separated out. I'm different than the rest. You know, like the, the part in the Bible that talks about, I'm glad I'm not like those sinners over there, Lord. Hmm. They felt as if somehow they had the right to sit at table with God. And what did they criticize Jesus for? For eating with sinners and tax collectors. 
I mean, if you stop and really reflect on that for a second, it's an absolute and total rejection of God's grace. For righteousness is not achieved. It's freely given. It had a tremendous cost. The cost of the blood of our Savior on the cross. While the cost was high, the gift is freely given through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. God's word to us is that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory and are in need of this grace and mercy that Jesus came to embody and proclaim. So Jesus did choose to eat and to drink and fellowship and commune with all of God's children, sinners, all, of all different kinds. He had women following Him. He had Gentiles, even Samaritans, rich and poor, healthy and physically challenged, spiritually challenged. He came to gather the lost and seemingly forsaken. Because Jesus was there, his message was for them and for us that none are forsaken by God. That is who God consistently proclaims his people should care for as well. As his disciples, our lives should be marked by the company that we keep, but not the company which popular culture would suggest that we follow around Because we ourselves are poor in spirit, lame from the effects of sin, oppressed by materialism, greed, lust, worship of celebrity, we are sinners in need of a Savior. But we are also the one sheep for which the good shepherd left the ninety-nine to save, to draw back from the edge. Therefore, we respond to the grace of God by seeking out others who are poor and lame and blind, oppressed by society, not the rich and powerful, but those ones like Mother Teresa was hanging around with in the streets of Calcutta. That is who Christ has called us to associate with, helping others who are hungry and homebound and in prison, addicted, homeless, mentally challenged. That is the company Jesus calls us to keep. And it's more than just sending our alms, giving money, although that is important. Resources are spare, especially for those who have so little to begin with. Yet we are also called to be with, to walk alongside those in need, as Jesus walked alongside and still walks with us. So it means getting involved with people, perhaps even sitting down together with them as equals in a table. I mean, isn't that what we do when we gather around? We sung the song. We invited all our welcome in this place. That is the pronouncement of this good news from all social status, from all racial status, from all economic status. Jesus comes to claim the sinner for God. And that is all of us. Luther's last written words on a piece of paper in his pocket, found just after he died, said three simple words. We are beggars. When we come to his table, we hold our hands out, for there is nothing else more we need And His Son, Jesus Christ, His body and blood feeds us, feeds us and strengthens us to send us out. Because we've had the opportunity to come and have the foretaste of the great wedding feast that Jesus has prepared for us. At that table, we picture God as the host of this meal and all of us sinners are are invited guests. Unable to reciprocate. To repay God's eternal hospitality. So we beggars gather around the table. We kneel together to receive his body and blood. Because we know that we are all welcome in this place. 
Faith in His love is what He offers if we receive this gift by faith. Faith in His forgiveness and His mercy. Faith in His eternal Word. The promise of our salvation. So our gift, our opportunity is to go forth from this place. To invite people of all status and no status. With great gifts and great needs to follow Christ to the fellowship of the table of our Lord. And we do this because we are the company. Jesus became flesh to keep. Thanks be to God. Amen.